Well, good evening, everybody. My name's Richard Jones. I'm the Pro Vice-Chancellor for Research at the University of Sheffield, and it's my great pleasure to introduce tonight's Hatfield le Lecture. So the Hatfield Lecture was, uh, is one of the, uh, the, the high points of uh, the university's calendar. It's a lecture in memorial of the late uh, William Herbert Hatfield, who set up a fund uh, in 1944 to, uh, uh, well, a fund was set up to, commem to commemorate his huge contributions to material science and metallurgy in this city. And of course, the city of Sheffield, there's no more appropriate city to commemorate one of the, uh, the, the great metallurgists who created the scientific basis for, for this enormously important technical subject. Uh, she Sheffield, of course, absolutely the center of that. So William Hatfield actually studied metallurgy here at Sheffield in the University of College before its establishment as a freestanding university. He won the Mappin Medal in 1902 and uh, the degree of Doctor of Metallurgy in 1913. And he was uh, pivotal in the fantastic uh, uh, explosion of scientific metallurgy at that time around the Firth Brown Research Laboratories in collaboration with the University of Sheffield as well. He worked on stainless steels and many other important uh, uh, technological advances. And there's nobody, I think, more appropriate to, to, to give tonight's Hatfield Lecture than Professor Mark Miodovnik. Uh, Mark is a, uh, known to many people, I think, he's been perhaps the most high profile, the most successful, the most vocal proponent of the importance of material science, the importance of uh, understanding the properties of materials for understanding the material basis of the whole world that we live in and the society that, uh, that, that, we, all, uh, that, that, that we all live in. So Mark is the uh, UCL Professor of Materials and Society. His uh, PhD came from Oxford, where he worked on uh, high temperature alloys for, for, for jet engines. He's worked in the USA and Ireland and the UK. And as I say, for more than 10 years, he's championed not just material science, but the links between material science and the arts and humanities to medicine and uh, uh, to, to all branches of engineering. Uh, he, he's pioneered the establishment of the Institute of Making at UCL. He's the director of that, and he runs the research program. And he's, as I say, he's very well known as a, uh, an author and a broadcaster. His television programs have reached huge audiences in many, many countries. And as I say, he's been a fantastic ambassador for this most important subject. Uh, he's, he was awarded the Royal Academy of Engineering Rook Medal in 2013. He was elected a Fellow of the Royal Academy of Engineering in 2014. And his most recent book, great book, is called Stuff Matters. It was, uh, it's been a bestseller, a New York Times bestselling book, and uh, it won the Royal Society Winton Prize for, uh, for, for, for science writing in 2014, and the US National Academy's Communication Award in 2015. So we're enormously honoured to have Mark Mirdovnik here tonight to tell us about material science. Mark. Um, yeah, I'm, well, I'm very, very honoured to be here. Sheffield is uh, one of my favourite cities. Um, I've been here many times over the years, and of course it's, you know, the, it's, it's one of the... The, the great places for materials, materials discovery, the home of steel, stainless steel, all these amazing materials that you, you as community over hundreds of years have created. So this is, this is a great place to talk about materials. I love, I love being here. Um, and this, this is a great opportunity, I thought, to sort of talk about the future of materials and what, what it might hold for us all. And... Um, when I was thinking about this, I was thinking, well, how, how to approach that subject? I mean, it's obviously difficult to talk about the future. And sometimes I hear other people talking about imagined futures, and I think, oh, well, what do you know? And you're probably thinking that now. I'm thinking, <laughs> actually, I probably need to turn on this microphone, actually. Shall I turn, yeah. Can you hear me, actually? Hold on a minute. I'll turn on this one, because I'm going to walk around a bit. OK. How's that? Is that better? No, we're going to switch. Good. Better. OK, good. So, you're, yeah, you might be thinking, yeah. What does he know? And uh, that's, that's, that's fair enough, I think. <laughs> but so I, I, wanted, I wanted to first of all just talk about the present, where materials have come from, a little bit about that, the present surroundings and the history of that stuff. And then, and then I'm going to use um, some of the things that we can learn about where the materials that came from in the past that we use every day. I'm going to try and use that as a kind of way of 
thinking about the future. And in doing so, yeah, I'm, I might be wrong about some things, and we, we can discuss that in the bar later. <laughs> okay, so where to start? Well, I thought you should start really in a mundane place, in, a, in an everyday situation, because that, I think, is where materials really are, you know, totally ignored by most people. But you and I, all of us in here, we don't ignore them. If you're standing at a bus stop, you're counting them, you're looking at them, you're thinking, huh, great, there aren't so many materials there. I'm really glad they're there, uh, especially steel in this place. And you don't really have to go to very many, uh, too much length, really, to pick out hundreds of materials in an everyday landscape. And people are always banging on about tropical forests and how brilliant they are and fantastically kind of diverse. But look, I give you the cityscape. That's an amazingly diverse place. And each one of these materials we invented. And the question is why? Why do we bother? Like we could have just gone on living in these tropical jungles, but we didn't, right? We wanted to create our own. And that's something to be human there. There is something very, very, very human about creating materials. We are the monkeys who chose a different life, this life. <laughs> and, uh, and in order to, to make this life wonderful, but also to meet our needs, so basic needs of shelter and warmth, but then you know, desires, dreams, we, cr we, we came up with this stuff, all of it. And each one of these, I argue, is a kind of answer to some dream, some desire. So we are living in the dreams of our past generations. They dreamt up this stuff that we now take for granted. <laughs> and the question is, what will we dream up for the next generation? What are we going to give them? That's what I would like to ask in the next half an hour, 40 minutes. And um, OK, so how to start with that? Well, I was gonna, as I was saying before, you could look at some of the histories of where this stuff has come from. And um, this is, this is a, it, 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 it's quite a complicated uh, diagram, but don't, don't take it to heart too much. I just want to show you something, which is this, that if you look at very long ago, you know, 50,000, you know, you know 5,000 BC, actually, our ancestors, clever that they were, had kind of come up with lots of, of the important materials we rely on today. They'd worked it out without any science at all, just their hands, just their inquisition, just their curiosity, their skill. And if you look at this, look, you know, glass, pottery, brick, cement, textile, skin, glues, wood, concrete, paper. And this, isn't, this is not meant to be encyclopedic. It's just meant to be illustrative. But it, you know, actually, most of the main classes of material that we rely on today, apart from electronic materials, were there. And then. There's a kind of, well, let me just go back. There's a, there, there's, it's not like there's a kind of nothing here, but there's, there is a moment where, late sort of 18th, 19th century, where actually, okay, lots of things happen. And hu there's a huge, huge blossoming of materials development. You get metal alloys, you get loads of metals, you get ceramics, you get bioglasses, you get all sorts of things. You get the invention of plastics, you get uh, polymers of all sorts, you get graphene, and, and you get composites and metal matrix composites and you know, carbon fiber composites. And although there's not, it's not that there's nothing happening here, but there is a scientific revolution that builds. And this scientific revolution suddenly gives us a set of tools, a set of tools to understand materials and then invent new ones. And that, that moment is really where material science starts to be born, in my view. That before this, materials is a, is a craft, it's, a, it's technique, it's, it's in people's hands, um, it's handed down generation by generation. But you get a point where the scientific revolution happens where suddenly it becomes about theory, about you know, uh, understanding the interior of, of materials. And I want to give you a sense of how that happened with a particular material, and I'm going to choose glass because it is at the heart of that. So glass, as we saw before, is a very old material. So you know the Egyptians worked out you could turn sand, which is basically silica, silica and oxygen, and if you melted it and then cooled it, you could make this transparent material that was jewel-like. And they could make this stuff. So this is a, a pectoral from Tutankhamun's tomb, and in the middle here is not a diamond right, or a, or a ruby, it's, and they had tons of that stuff, right, they were rich, they had loads of gold, okay, but they chose to put, on this very important king, they chose to put something with a piece of glass in it, 
And the question you have to ask is why? Why is glass elevated, even though they have jewels and they have rubies and they have gold and silver? And the answer is that the Egyptians cared about the afterlife. They cared about transformation. And one of the big hallmarks of understanding materials is understanding transformation. And transforming sand into something jewel-like, something opaque into something transparent. And they could do it, and that, that signified to them this kind of this, this, this ability to go into the afterlife, right? So um, the magical properties, if you like, of that transformation. But they couldn't make anything out of glass that was actually kind of functional. That was left to the Romans. The Romans took that basic process, and they, first of all, they understood how to change the melting point, and that was very useful because otherwise you're at 1,500 degrees, and no one wants to be at 1,500 degrees. It's really hard work in terms of getting the temperatures there and also keeping those temperatures and making big objects at that temperature really hard. So they managed to work out that if you take natrium and you put it in there, you can reduce the melting point and you can start, to, you can start playing around with glass at 800, 900 degrees. And they even worked out how to blow through a pipe into a gobul of glass and they will blow into existence objects. So this is a wine goblet and it's made through glass blowing, which the Romans invented. And this is 2,000 years old still survives today, and what an object. Now, the people who can do that, right, the people who can do that understand a material, really understand it. And they, they invented many things at that point. They first of all invented the fact that uh, you can do glass blowing, that you can make glass into very fine filaments. And so they also meant, invented the window. So the window before this, right, the wind, if you want some light in your house or temple or whatever, then you have a hole and it's called a wind hole, right? And the wind comes through it. And if you don't want the wind to come through it, then you close some shutters or a curtain, but then you don't have the light. And the Romans are the ones who created a process that you could put a, a, an opaque material over it, uh, sorry, a transparent material, which they made, and it's called the glass window. And of course, we, this is one of the few buildings that I've given this type of talk where you can't actually point to that. But anyway, <laughs> you know what I mean. OK, so, um, so. If you, if you fast forward to that, you, you know, you've got people who know it with their hands, who are making these amazing transformations. They're changing architecture. They're changing the way that we drink things. And, and they would serve kings and queens. They would make things like this. So this is, this is you know, now we're talking about the Middle Ages. And, and this is the processes they know. They can do gilding. They can do cutting. They can do etching. So this is acid, making this cherub. They can cast this object, very fine tolerances. They can make this object out of glass. Again, so this is all with their hands, all with their eye. It's an impressive, impressive ability. And um, what does that allow you to do? Well, that allows you, it turns out, to make this stuff. OK, you can make a lens, because you have that much skill. And before this point, right, so if you, if you were like me, and you were born not being able to see very well, that was it in life. You just weren't ever going to see very well. Sorry. Um, and if you're like lots of people in this room of a certain age, your eyesight got worse as you got older. Tough. You fell in a ditch, you died, sorry. You know, that was it. That was the hard life that they lived. But suddenly you've got people who know glass, and they're not just making glasses to drink out of, or windows, they're making lenses that correct your eyesight. This is a pivotal moment in human history, because this is where materials people come to the rescue of everyday humans and say, I will restore your vision. It's, it's really magical. It's a really important moment. And at first, of course, it's for a very few people, scholars perhaps, important people. But it soon you know, accelerates. And as you know today, that, that's really come to, to the aid of everyone, not, not in the whole world. But that's, you know, that's a really amazing achievement of a material and of a set of people. But this also has other implications. So as soon as you make a, a lens like that, you can put them end to end, and you get a telescope, and now you get magnification. Now, without glass and without people who can make very, very good lenses, this doesn't happen. And if this doesn't happen, then you don't get Galileo looking up into the heavens, and here he is depicted here, and you don't get him seeing for the first time in human history ever that Jupiter has moons, because you cannot see them with the naked eye. It doesn't matter how good your eyesight is, you will never see them. So you need a telescope, and if you don't have glass, and you, Importantly, if you don't have people who can make glass, who understand it, you cannot have a telescope, you cannot have astrophysics, you cannot have the whole 
of that side of understanding the universe, understanding whether it's us that really does go around the sun, that the other planets really do go around the sun, that they have moons. All of that stuff starts with these glass lenses and this telescope. Once this happens, you have other people using glass for experiments. And here's Newton using a glass prism. And what he does, he, he does what everyone had done for a long time, actually, which is that you put a, a piece of this prism in front of a, of, a, of a beam of light, and you get colors. This wasn't new. People had done this for a long time. Anyone who'd ever lived in a palace with chandeliers had seen these little pretty patterns on the wall. But he did something clever. He went, OK, you all think, when that was the general idea was that the colors came from inside the glass. They were produced inside the glass. He was like, well, OK, if that's true, then if I gather up these colors and I put them back through another prism, then I will get more colors. But what he found when he did that experiment was that when you gather them together again, you get white light again. So when you add all the colors together, you get white. And that proved that white light is the dirtiest mixture, right? the gungiest impure substance you can think of. It's, it's full of different wavelengths. And what's pure is these individual wavelengths of color. And that he invents optics at this point. And it changes the whole way that people look at light and therefore understand the world. And he could not have done it without glass. Not satisfied with that, the glass makers then start making things like this, which is a microscope. Now, this, this is where materials really start to uh, bootstrap themselves. Because if you have a microscope, as you know in this town where Sorby really was one of the pivotal people to use a microscope to look at the tiny things in the world, and instead of looking at bacteria, which is what people use the early microscopes to look at and discover a whole, whole world of biology, he looked at materials, metals, rocks, and he found that they had an inner life that no one had ever seen before. And why not? Because you can't see it with the naked eye. <laughs> you have to have a microscope. But once you have a microscope, you can see that metals are incredibly sophisticated things. Loads is going on inside metals, but you just need the right tool to see them. And he couldn't have seen it without glass. More of that in a bit. But then and glass comes to the rescue of materials again, because um, until this point, really, if you were interested in materials and you were interested in their transformations, you were, um, you were an alchemist. And, um, and they had good reason to think that materials could transform from one to the other. They had glass, for instance, which is which an astounding transformation. And there are lots of things you can do with metals that make them look like they're transforming from one to another. And so, but you did those experiments looking down at a hearth in a crucible. And that was very difficult to see what's going on. And there's lots of smoke. And you went a bit mad. And they, they literally did go mad. And um, because it was mercury and zinc and all this stuff coming off, and you know, they really were doing, they were really trying to make it. But it was difficult work. Um, and there were a lot of charlatans around who were sort of using mercury and gold in different ways. But then someone comes along, and they invent the glass test tube. And now, now you can analyze materials in a totally different way. Now you can look across through this transparent material. You can do it in a solution. You can see a precipitate forming. You can see a gas coming off. You can literally see bubbles. And then you can capture those bubbles. And you, then you can analyze the bubbles. This is the birth of chemistry. Go into any chemistry lab. What do you see? It's full of glass. <laughs> it is the subject. Like Without this material, chemistry just doesn't happen. And so glass itself, this amazing material, invent a new way of analyzing materials. Composition via chemistry, microstructure via the optical microscope, and then other microscopes that come along. And so that's really what I want to say, which is that when you talk about materials, and, and this, in a sense, we, I, t I showed you that kind of landscape of the world and how all these materials came along. And there was this big, you know, when you look at the history, there's a massive um, explosion of materials in the 19th uh, and 20th century is because we got to grips with the inner life of materials. And, and understanding that has then allowed us into this knowledge base that you can't get to without seeing, using a microscope. And so this, this slide here really is about our sum total knowledge. I know that sounds a grand thing to say. This is our sum total knowledge in a way. All you need to know about material science, not all you need to know about material science, <laughs> Anyway, but if you know this, you know a lot. And this is basically what we discovered. So 
Let me talk it through. I mean, there's a lot of material scientists in the audience who know this stuff, so just bear with me, but I just want to kind of go through it again. So it turns out that all materials are made of different structures, and those structures are held within each structure, so it's like a Russian doll. So it's easier to understand in the biological side. So here's the living world, and so this is animate matter. And so you have big stuff like trees, and then whales and mice, and have fleas on the mice, and then hairs on the flea. And then if you look into these hairs, you find that they're made of tissues, lots of different cell types. And if you look into those, you find that there are individual cells. So the cell, OK? And these cells are amazing things. You can see them under a microscope. So this is small stuff down here. And um, everything is made of them. You're made of them. I'm made of them. These flowers are made of them. Uh, you all started from one cell, in fact. <laughs> and so did a whale, and so did a tree. And these cells change, they grow, they divide. And then they can turn into the bark of a tree, or they can turn into the teeth of a whale, or they can turn into your skin, or they can turn into something transparent in your eye. That's really amazing. <laughs> We still don't really understand how that works. But one of the things we do know is that if you look inside those cells to look for clues to how a single cell can do all those different things, you find it's made of lots of macromolecules like this. And these might be a million atoms large, maybe more. And these are machines. And they're not, that's not a metaphor. They actually are machines. They, they go around the cell doing stuff. They'll go along, and they'll find a membrane. They'll open it up, and they'll let a sodium atom through, and they'll close it again. And no one is telling them to do that, <laughs> we think. <laughs> uh, they do it. They kind of they have this, they have this behavior, which, is, it's just, it's, which must be just to do with the laws of physics at that scale in that environment. But nevertheless, because they have many of these machines doing many, many things. They organize themselves. They even build themselves. And you ask, where do they, how do they know how to build themselves? Well, there's stuff in the middle called DNA. And the DNA is the code for those machines. So the DNA patterns different molecules. And those pattern the cell types. And those cell types pattern the tissues. And that creates a hair. And then you get an organism. And at every different scale, you have different things going on. And at every different scale, you have different properties. So you might have a mouth with hair that's brown. And um, if you change a gene down here, you change some of these molecules. And that changes how cells behave. And that ch changes what tissues behave. And that may, that may mean that the hairs all fall out. And it dies of cancer, perhaps. Or it may mean that it goes blonde. But the important thing is, there is no limit to this. So when you think about you and me in this diagram, and you thinking a thought or having a relationship with someone, it is to do with all these different structures interacting. And it isn't a one-way interaction. It's not like things down here only travel up the scale. Things at big scales travel down the scale. So you, if you go and live in a desert, then you turn on different genes. Your cells behave differently, and actually, you're a different person. <laughs> so there's something to do with the physics and chemistry of all these different scales in you, in me, that is about life. Something about, that makes it alive, that you alive, me alive. And it's, it's got something to do with the fact that there are all these different scales, and they're constantly changing the scale above them. But they're feeding, there's also a feedback loop into their scale. So information is going up and down these scales. OK, so that's living matter. It's impressive stuff. <laughs> okay, I won't dwell on it, because that's not the point of today. The point is this, that it turns out, if you're wondering why materials are so amazing, like ceramics and glasses and metals and plastics, and there's so many different types of material, is because they have all these scales too. And actually, we've worked out that we can fiddle around with many more atom types than biology does. Biology basically builds everything out of carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, and it throws in a few other elements for good measure. <laughs> but it does everything really out of very few elements. But we. We've taken advantage of iron and carbon and lots of different elements. And we've built lots of stuff. And they've all got these scales of structure in them. So um, you know, you look at this. I think this must be ceramic. No, it's plastic. <laughs> this very high quality plastic <laughs> at the front here has all those scales in it. That floor has all these scales in it. And, what, and how do you see them? Well, you see them with these microscopes we talked about. 
and we now have very advanced microscopes, and we can get all the way down to atoms. So we can now see atoms. And what do we see? Well, obviously, we have big things like buildings and robots and very smartphones. <laughs> and if you look inside those, you have tiny wires. And if you look inside those, you'll find there are little machines in which the features of those machines, tiny little features, are the size of a hair on a flea. And those are the little machines that tell your smartphone which way up you're holding it. And if you drop it, to turn, to lock it, accelerometers. Those are the machines that tell your car it's in a crash, and they deploy the, uh, the airbag. That's that scale of object. But if you, look in, if you look even more carefully, and I put this in on purpose for this audience, <laughs> you find that actually metals and ceramics and lots of things are made of crystals. And these crystals have special properties. So this is a, a, a steel crystal, and it's got these little lamella in it. You can see them. And this is what Sorby saw <laughs> more than 150 years ago, I think, or around 150 years ago which was that if you want to know why different steels are different from each other, you have to get down to this scale. And you have to see that, that actually they may have the same amount of carbon in, but the way that carbon is placed inside the crystal changes everything about that steel. And in this case, this is, this is something called perlite, these little lamella. So if you can see that, then you can do experiments to make sure you get it or not get it, depending on what you want, you see. So you have control at this scale. And it turns out if you control that scale, you control the strength of a steel. And you might not care, but that's the difference between a bridge falling down or not. That's, bridge, that's the difference between a, a ship being able to withstand a huge wave or not. And so controlling this did make a big difference to industry. It was a big, big, big part of, of the Industrial Revolution. And then the next scale down, which we started to understand, was this sort of very micro scale. And here is a single crystal here of silicon. And this is a single transistor. Now, you have about 100 billion of these in your phone, and they're all connected. And although that's not as amazing as what nature can do and make a brain out of cells, it's still pretty impressive. And it can do lots of things, like it can download Netflix movies for you, which is nice. And um, it can phone your mum, which is even better, let's face it. Um, and you can type things, and you can do searches on Google, all thanks to these little tiny slivers of silicon all connected up. And if you couldn't connect them up at this scale, you wouldn't have a smartphone or a laptop. Right? So this whole information technology revolution is because of this little thing here, understanding this scale. And why people are so excited about this scale is because it's the sort of the next one, the next level, that actually silicon chips are maxing out in their power and their speed. And the reason is because actually getting down to this scale, which is called a nanoscale, is quite difficult. To manipulate things at that scale is quite difficult. To actively change the script things. And, and one of the reasons it's quite difficult is because at this scale, when you put things somewhere, they don't stay there. So over here, at the same scale, you have these macromolecules building themselves and busying around and doing stuff, right? It turns out that once you get to this scale, other stuff does that too. So this is a, a carbon buckyball. You take it apart, it'll put itself back together again. And so there's something called self-assembly down here, which, which is it's part of the normal physics and chemistry of the universe, as far as we know. There's nothing magical in the sense that this is not life. It's not a hallmark of life, even though life uses it. But it does give us an opportunity. It gives us an opportunity for whole different sets of materials, materials that build themselves, materials that look after themselves. And this is one of the themes I want to talk about, which is this, that We've built quite amazing materials on this side, right? man-made materials, by mastering all these different scales of structure. But what our materials don't do is what nature's materials do do, which is they don't build themselves, they don't look after themselves, they don't heal themselves. But could they? If you admit that this side, all of those things that are happening on this side are, are the same physics and chemistry, but just arranged in a slightly cleverer way, not slightly clever, much cleverer, <laughs> then we should be able to do it on this side. We should be able to build buildings that can heal themselves if they get cracked, or bridges, or phones that when they have a problem actually remedy themselves. You don't have to go to a shop and have your screen, screen mended. You could, it would mend itself. Give it some lemsit, maybe. So could it be possible that we could do this? That's the question I want to ask. I know it's taken me a long time to get to it, but now you have all the information. OK, so, here's, so here it is. Here is what I think we might do in the next 50 years. And 
why, so I, we could choose anything, and I, in lots of ways, I think that that will happen. I think that there are so many people doing so many different materials, uh, so much materials research that lots of stuff's going to happen. I, and I, I've only got 20 minutes or so to take you through what I think are some interesting strands. So this is not meant to be authoritative, but I, the, re, the lens I'm taking is what our needs. So I think if you look at concrete or glass, they met very clear material needs for us. We needed buildings that would withstand. We needed infrastructure that was cheap and available to everyone. Um, we needed windows that really did keep the rain out <laughs> um, and let light in. Who doesn't go to a new flat or a new house and just look at how much light you get? Every, you know, that is a real human need. So what are the human needs of the future? That's the question I think is worth asking. And I think energy is going to be one because we've got to wean ourselves off fossil fuels because of global warming. So um, how are we going to do it? Well, one of the ways is to collect solar energy. So solar energy is plentiful. If we only collect 1% of the solar flux hitting the Earth, we'll be fine. Like, we'll meet all our energy needs. <laughs> that seems easy. 1%, how hard can that be? Well, it's appreciably hard, because that means you have to cover 1% of a city <laughs> with, let's say, solar cells. And in fact, you have to cover more than that, because the solar cells that you might cover it with are not very efficient at the moment. 20% efficient is good when they're new, but they quickly decline, they get dirty, that's worse. They're in shade, that's even worse. <laughs> Nature, of course, doesn't do it this way. Nature builds things that move in the sun, that rotate, and that will probably be what we do, I imagine. So we'll end up having buildings that do lean or change shape in the sun. But one of the things we're going to need to do, I think, is going to be put the solar cells into the fabric of buildings. And Locking them on the outside doesn't make too much sense from an engineering perspective, because if one of these panels goes wrong, getting there to replace it is a lot of energy, and it's a lot of time. And if you, if you do the calculation about how many of these things we'd need, we'd spend the whole time repairing them. So we, we need two things. We need to be able to work out how to make a lot of them cheaply, and we need to make them repair themselves. And that doesn't seem impossible, but here's what we have to do, I think. So at the moment, we can make you know, massive panels and just, just produce them. But it's kind of a dumb way to do it. And that's because we're building things with components. We make the component, and then we just sort of double it. But what nature does, and what is probably a, more, uh, a better way of doing things for us, is, is, to, is to look down at the micro and nano scale and create materials down at this scale that not just harvest energy, but actually funnel light, so these are little light guides that you can build, and they're tiny. And if you can get, if we can get building materials that intrinsically have a skin of this material, and then harvest light by funneling it down these things and then collecting it, and then inputting it into the infrastructure of the building, you can imagine that we would have cities that would be very powerful energy generators. So it will all, I think the big challenge for us is, is actually is, is, is not just working out these bits of the equation, which actually are all being worked out now in labs around the world. Um, and there are many, many new solar cell technologies coming on, perovskites, and all these things look very exciting. But, but what people are forgetting, I think, is that it won't, in my view, be about just solving the problem at one scale. We have to solve it at the macro scale to get the harvesting of the big energy. So whatever we do down here, it has to scale up. It has to be part of a building material which you can actually pour <laughs> with a concrete mixer. It's got to be at that scale if it's going to have a big impact. And that is, that's still to do. But that isn't beyond us, I think. Um, the other thing we're going to have to do is that we have to harvest energy, but we have to store it. Because half the time, it's night, and we need to use the energy, and the sun is not going to be shining. And battery technology has got a long, long way to go. But at the moment, it's kind of monolithic. So when you look at electric cars, they have this enormous pack of batteries in them, lithium batteries, that are just this block. And it's not, it, it doesn't make too much sense to me, because actually what you really want is the battery material to be part of the fabric of the car, to be maybe the line of the car, because actually batteries need an anode and a cathode, and you've got You've got a lot of surface area here, which you could use to make an anode and cathode. So why wouldn't the battery be part of the fuselage of the car? That would make a lot of sense. 
Um, especially if you can then optimize it with mechanical properties too. So you're solving two problems at once. And um, again, this has got to be a scale problem. We've got really good down here making batteries and lithium and little, little ions intercalating. And we've got good at making big stuff. But what we haven't got good at is putting the two together. And I think that's going to be the big challenge for us as a community. It's not, it's not being clever at any one scale, but actually being clever at putting the scales together. That, that's the only way I see us being able to, to meet the challenge of electric cars or, and or storing, storing energy in the fabric of a building. And the other thing that's going to probably really be important is that you see this with the Tesla car. So the Tesla car is an electric car. It's a very high performance car, the most high performance, really. It, um, it's still limited in its range because of this battery power um, being a sort of monolithic. Um, but, the, but, the, but in order to kind of mitigate that, they've made the, the chassis very, very lightweight. And how they've done that, they've done it with carbon fiber technology, which is very lightweight material, hot, stiff and strong. And um, so it feels to me like we've got to also bring that technology in. Like carbon is the right material for this job for transportation. Mostly our trains and our cars are made of steel. And, but our planes are made of carbon fiber now because we just need the efficiency gain from the lightweight. And it feels to me, if you want electric cars, you're going to have to go down a mass production of carbon fiber. The question is, how do you do it? And again, so that we have carbon fiber airplanes, we have carbon fiber cars, we even have carbon fiber bikes. <laughs> and so we, could, we can do it at a kind of bespoke level. And what those things, if you look at them under the microscope, you find that they're made of these sort of little fabric of carbon, which is, which, is, which is bonded together with a plastic. And if you look at them under the microscope, you see the little fibers. And if you look that, at them under the microscope, you find it's mostly amorphous carbon. So these fibers are good. They're good enough to make very high-tech planes and cars and bikes. But they could be so much better, because down here, we've got graphene and nanotubes, which are so much, so much stronger than amorphous carbon. But no one is linking up these with these structures. So you have things like you know, the Graphene Center in Manchester. And they, their challenge is to take something that's essentially atomic scale and make it into objects that are this scale. And that is a huge, huge undertaking, which will probably take 20 years. But I think it is, it is a direction of travel we have to go down. And it will be the people who can, again, link up these scales. It's the manufacturers, it's the makers, it's the, it's the engineers who are as important as, as the materials discoverers. OK, and then finally on energy, just to say this, I, I mean, people talk a lot about fusion energy coming to our rescue. So solar, I, talk, I, I talked about solar. You could talk about wind, or you could talk about um, any of the, they all have materials challenges. Um, fusion has arguably the biggest materials challenge. So even though physicists now have got plasmas, which will bond atoms together, so that's what fusion is. You take two atom types, and you bond them together, and you get some extra energy out of creating a hybrid atom. Um, what that also creates is, is very fast neutrons. And those neutrons hit the side of what it, whichever in chamber you've got with the plasma in it, and they destroy it. <laughs> and they absolutely cane it. And if you think we've got a problem with, with nuclear reactors doing fission, <laughs> fusion is like an order of magnitude harder to build something out of. So you might even be able to make a plasma that could give you more energy out than you put in but you could never make a reactor that would last more than six months without falling apart. So there's an even bigger problem there, which is how do we make materials that can withstand high neutron densities? And I think pretty much no one has any idea about that. But that's, <laughs> that's one for the far future. So that's energy. And I think there's an enormous amount there that we could really gain from. Um, and it's, it's going to be a direction of travel. This generation has to solve that problem. Otherwise, we will be in deep trouble with global warming. Um, what about cities? So if you do the stats, it looks like, at the moment, 70% of people in the UK live in cities. By 2050, it will be 80%, 84%. Worldwide, there will be 10 billion people, give or take, not, you know, half a billion. And, and about 70% of them will live in cities. So cities are going to grow. That's almost certain. It's probably a good thing, because they're probably the most sustainable way of delivering people their needs and you know, basically material needs for, for living. 
but how are we going to do it? How are we going to kind of grow this infrastructure for all these people? Um, OK, well, one of the problems is this, that we've got clever. We've managed to create very efficient lighting, for instance. So we can give light to everyone in the city. And we've even passed legislation to make a compact for us and, you know, mandatory, right? <laughs> but in doing that, in making something like a fluorescent bulb, we've, we've had to create that bulb out of all these highlighted elements on the periodic table here. Now, the ones in a sort of brownie red are either endangered or rare or in conflict zones or toxic. <laughs> okay? So mercury, for instance, is in your light bulbs. And at the end of its life, it just goes in the bin. <laughs> that is not going to be healthy for a city, and it's not going to be healthy for city life. Tungsten, tungsten is, is getting rarer. The US have already started to stockpile it. It's so important for machining. And people just don't know how to deal with the fact that we're creating, each one of these is a mine somewhere, more than one mine. It, you put all this stuff together. You make something tr fantastic and efficient, right? But then, what do you do with it afterwards? We don't have any answers at the moment. We just sort of throw it away. <laughs> smartphones, even worse. You have half of the period table in your smartphone, if you own one. And look at how many elements here are amazing elements that are sort of endangered or risk. I mean, look at this. And at the end of their lives, smartphones mostly get liquidized. <laughs> they do actually get liquidized. And, um, and people recover things like gold and platinum. But that's it. The rest of it goes in the bin. That's bonkers. I mean, that is just absolutely bonkers. How have we got to this point? Well, partly because we've been so intoxicated about creating new materials and mining them and being clever. And we have. We've been really great. But we've just forgotten the end of life thing completely, which has been fine because there have been lots of holes in the ground. And we haven't had resource imitation. And, but in 30 years' time, we are going to have it big time. And uh, we're going to have 10 billion people who all want one of these. And that's going to be hard to meet that need. So we need to find a way of dealing with this complexity and the complexity of the materials that we're creating. And then there's the kind of sustainability issue around those cities. So, so actually, what will we build the cities out of? Well, probably what we build them out of now, because they're really brilliant materials. Steel, cement, paper. You know, these are fantastic materials, materials that we've spent thousands of years developing, as we saw earlier. But, and they, they, they account for an appreciable amount of our industrial carbon emissions. So you might say, well, look, we'll, we'll build cities out of something different in the future, which has lower carbon emissions. But it, it actually may not be the right answer, because when you've created these cities, if they hang around for 100 years or 200 years, you're not creating more carbon emissions. right? If once you've made the steel, you carry on reusing it, or if you make a concrete bridge and it lasts for 200 years, then you can divide by 200 the amount of carbon emissions per year. So, and when you go to these factories and you ask them, you see how many people are there and you see their efficiencies. Their efficiencies are amazing. So these are very, very mature materials technologies. They're not going to get more efficient. And, they're, and they meet our needs really well. But what we really need to do is, is not keep knocking buildings down after having only built them for 20 years. Or don't build bridges that are only going to last for 30 years. We need to build things that are going to last for 100 years. That's the only way to get these materials into some sort of sustainable balance with the environment. And one of the things that we're going to have to do to solve all of those complexity problems and repair problems is basically have a circular economy. I'm absolutely convinced of this. So that instead of it coming out of the ground, it getting used and going into a dump, we've got to be bringing stuff back in. And we've got to be thinking always when we make something, the bigger it is, the longer it has to last. The smaller it is, the, smaller it can, the shorter time it can last. But then you need a way of bringing those nutrients back in. So this diagram from Ellen MacArthur Foundation is quite a neat one. There's lots of different ones. But basically, you have the sort of bio side and the man-made side. And you, and you have this looping structure. Now, we, as a society, have been totally unable to bring this into being so far. <laughs> both economically, both from a policy perspective, and there's some bits of science that really need to happen in order to make this happen. But I'm absolutely convinced we're going to need to do this if we want 10 billion people to have the lifestyles that we have in the future. And they are all going to want it. 
And there's no reason why they shouldn't have it. I think we're clever enough to do it, but we just have to move wholesale to a different way of thinking about making objects. And one of the ways I'm convinced we're going to need to do it is to make, if you want to make something last 200 years, it's going to have to heal itself. If you're going to want a building which harvests its own energy and is you know, 70, 80 stories high, it's going to have to heal itself. Those, those, your smartphone, if you want it to last 10 years in your pocket, and it has a tiny little damage in one of its chips, instead of you just replacing that, wouldn't it be great if that chip could heal itself? You're saying, maybe that's impossible. I'm saying, we do it now. Like, you are healing yourself now. <laughs> your body's doing it all the time. The physics and chemistry exists. Can we do it? Well, um, here is some self-healing concrete. This is already in production. And it's, it's, it's sort of baby steps in this direction, but at least it exists. And people, there's huge numbers of people working in self-healing materials. And, and how it works is this. Inside the concrete is some little bacteria. And these are bacteria that will lie dormant for 50 years or more until a crack opens up inside the bridge, let's say. And it, those bacteria are then are exposed to humid air. And they wake up, and they look around for food. And they find it because the concrete manufacturers leave little bits of food inside the material, starch, yeah, they do. And, um, and so they eat it, delicious, oh, delicious. And then, and then they, uh, they reproduce, right? Because they're feeling luxurious and life's good. And, um, and then they have a poo. You know, it's all these things that we do. And as they excrete calcite, which is a mineral, and it's one of the major constituents of concrete, and so they eat their way out of the crack, leaving pristine material behind them, and reproducing and reproducing and eating and reproducing and excreting and reproducing and re until they get to the edge, until they've got right to the edge of the crack. And now they die, unfortunately, a horrible death, because there's no more food. And, um, but they've done their job. They've healed that crack in that building or that bridge. Now, that is an example of a mechanism using a biological organism. And you might say that's cheating. And in some ways, I agree with you. But I also think it sort of it brings up another, I think, materials trend, which is this intersection between the biology, the biological world, and the man-made world. That, that, that actually, phones of the future might have bacteria in them that do things for that phone. It's not, it sounds weird, but we, we are mostly bacteria, <laughs> right? And we would not be able to operate our guts Many of our organs right, rely on things that happen inside our guts, which other bacteria do for us. Why not phones? Why not buildings? Why not bridges? Who knows what will happen? But that's an exciting future, I think. And it needs to happen. And then, OK, so now imagine we've got as much energy as we want. We've solved the energy problem. We've got cities that self-heal and gather energy, and phones that you don't have to constantly replace, but you do anyway because of fashion. No, but anyway, uh, we'll never get rid of that. Um, but now, now you have another need, desire, dream. Now you want to live forever. Or at least not forever, but you want to live more than your 60, 70 years. So at the turn of the 20th century, the life expectancy was 50. A baby born in this country would, on average, get to 50. Now it's 80. For people born today, it's probably going to be 100. But the last 20 years are not your happiest years often. Why? Because basically your system degrades, and you have ailments and injuries, and you can't play tennis anymore or go skiing anymore, inevitably. right? But what if you could? What if you didn't live forever, let's say, but you lived till 100, still on your annual skiing trip? or still playing tennis, or in the world championship for tennis, for centenary. So 100-year-old world championship. So the Davis Cup would look totally different. <laughs> yeah. So how could we make that happen? That feels to me like a very tangible desire and dream. Is it possible? I think it's probably more possible than almost anything else I've talked about so far, because that, that, that desire, that need, is being pulled forward at a very, very, very fast rate. And I just want to kind of pull out a few things that are happening now. So one of which is this. 3D printing's come along, and it's kind of done something really amazing. So this is the technology, if you don't already know it, where you take a digital file. So here is a digital file of this person's jaw. It's a real jaw. This person had cancer. And they basically took an MRI picture of, of her, and they reconstructed a digital file of her jaw. And then they press print, and out comes this jaw. 
right? The whole object comes out of the machine. And it's actually produced, it's produced through a powder method, a titanium, and basically have lasers that, that basically bond it together, layer by layer by layer by layer. And you'll see these holes. These holes look wrong. And they're there because the density of titanium is, doesn't match your jaw, and you don't, you don't want something that's overly heavy in your mouth. So this, is the, you know, so this illustrates that you can't, at the moment, print bone or bone-like material. But here is a bespoke piece of your body being made for you in the hospital. This is, this is happening already. This is going to increase. Um, what next? Well, people are already, when they're planning very delicate surgery on infants, and where it really, I mean, it comes down to tiny cuts and getting it absolutely right, what they're doing is they're doing MRI scans of the heart of this, this kid, for instance, they're then printing the heart out in the hospital. The surgeons and the nurses all then plan the surgery around the actual model of the heart. They actually know exactly what they're going to do. In some cases, they then model it in terms of fluid dynamics. And then, then they do the surgery. So, so these things are already in place. Here's something else that's already in place, which is prosthetics. So, um, and this is a slightly different thing. This is not in the hospital. This is, this is open data. So this is a hand that this guy, this boy, printed himself on his own 3D printer. For, you know, he bought, bought the printer with his dad for $200. He's printing out this hand with moving parts and a little bit of electronics. And this is open data given to anyone. You can size it to suit yourself. Um, and it's cheap. This is much cheaper than buying a $50,000 prosthetic hand. And people prefer it. A lot of the patients prefer it because it grows with them. They can have several. When they're playing basketball, you can have 10 fingers. This helps. <laughs> apparently. Um, and, and in war zones, they're shipping 3D printers out to war zones because where people are being blown up and have, losing limbs, you can actually give them something there and then that exactly fits them. And you can do it at a price that you can afford, uh, they can afford, that, that, that society can afford. So this is really tremendously exciting. How far could you push it? Could you, could you print a heart or a liver? Like, there's massive waiting lists on kidneys. You probably have... I'm sure in this room we have people who are either on the waiting list or know people who are on it. People die on the waiting list all the time. Could we print out a kidney? Well, people are trying it. They're printing cells. It doesn't work very well, partly because cells really object to being printed. It's, um, they're so sophisticated. They're like, I'm so humiliated. I'm going to die. Anyway, but uh, it's, no, it's probably because of the sheer forces. But anyway, who knows what it is, but they don't do so well. Um, but... Um, and also, anyway, it doesn't really take advantage of the fact that the cells are very, very sophisticated things. They can, they can reproduce themselves. They don't, you don't need to print something cell by cell to get a heart or a liver. In fact, what you need to do is create an environment in which those, a one cell can turn into many cells and make a liver itself, because they're all programmed to do it. You, you, your original liver <laughs> right, grew itself. How would you do that? Well, that's a technique called scaffolding, which, which turns out to be very, very important. So what you do, this is a microscopic picture. So these are individual cells of a patient. And you make a tiny little scaffold of fibers. And you have to, what you have to do is make sure those fibers, the chemistry of those fibers, is something that these cells like to sit on. So that's a bit of chemistry. You then have to, weirdly, you have to make sure that the holes inside that they're going to grow into, they're the right shape. If they're a square, for instance, you'll get a skin cell if they're a triangle you'll get a liver cell. And it's not quite clear why these mechanical cues are so important, but they are really important. So you have to create the right environment, a scaffold. But if you get the right environment, they will proliferate, and they will create an organ. So you can grow, and people do, livers and kidneys, from individual stem cells of patients. And this is just to show you where the state of the art is. So this is a patient who had cancer of the throat. And you have material scientists creating the right scaffold to create that tissue type. And making and do an MRI scan of the person, right, to get exactly the right shape of the of their thorax, uh, not thorax, um, throat, <laughs> and um, and then they then seeded it with the patient's own stem cells and put it into a box that's called a bioreactor, which has the right humidity, and they give it some food. And now, if you get everything right, the cells proliferate and they create the right tissue. And then what they did two weeks later is they operate on the patient. They take out they. they cut out their throat, they replace it with this one, and then 
they cross their fingers. Because at that point, it's not going to have food unless the body provides it. It's got to get the blood vessels have got to grow into it and provide that food. And that has to happen over a few days. But not every patient survives, but they do. So these are baby steps down the road of growing your own replacement organs and body parts. And who knows, really, and honestly, people do, do not know how far this can go. But it's, it's very, very exciting. Um, and that brings me to my final topic, really, which is, which is how are we going to discover all these new materials that I think we need? <laughs> Partly because I think we're going to have to we're going to have to deliver them in terms of global population and gl climate change, but partly because we're going to want to because we want to live longer, better lives, play tennis when you're 100. Who doesn't want to do that? Um, and so this this is loosely called material discovery, right? How do you discover these techniques, these engineering and scientific techniques? Um, and there is a great appetite for this to become much more theory led. So as I was showing in that original diagram. Basically, all the materials, all the basic materials that we survive on today were discovered by clever people with their hands without any technique or science before. <laughs> and most materials, even in the 19th and 20th century, were discovered by experiment, right? Stainless steel here in Sheffield, the same way. It wasn't theory-led, really. Um, just Harry Brealey and a great experimentalist knew something brilliant when he saw it. But will that be, continue to be the case? So here's the question. There are lots and lots of people who think that actually doing the quantum mechanics, so this is understanding how atoms bond together, you can then discover in a computer loads of different materials and their properties, electrical properties, magnetic properties. And you could you can do a million experiments in a computer and find a really tasty material. And then you could once you found it in the computer, you could then use it and develop it. And my problem with this has always been that 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 scale of individual molecules being simulated is only one scale. And as we've already discovered, materials are multi-scale. And it's the multi-scale nature of them that makes them so alive, so complex. And so this, if it's only at one scale, in my view, will only ever be very much part of the solution, and a small part at that. Um, because of this problem, right? if you're only simulating things down here, then you might discover something interesting. But if you can't work out how it connects to this scale, and 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 then delivers you something that will help you walk, or then delivers you a building that heals itself, well, it's not going to be helpful to us. And these scales, simulating those, gets harder and harder and harder. <laughs> um, so it may sound, you may, you may go to talks about quantum mechanics and think, oh my god, that's a complex subject. But it's the easy bit. <laughs> Right? This bit is the easy bit. This bit is the hard bit. And that's why experiment has been so much our guide. And that's why you need lots of different people with lots of different skills to actually do anything new these days. And I just want to talk about what our model has been. Because we think, uh, the Institute of Making, where I'm working and which I co-founded, um, that we can't deliver these materials that I think we're going to need and want and desire by just sitting in engineering departments and physics departments and chemistry departments and kind of dreaming them up. We need to involve psychologists and designers and medics and humanities scholars and architects right at the beginning when we're trying to design these things, because they know bits of the problem at their different scales. And they're all expert, but unless we can work as a team, we'll never get anywhere. So that's, that's our model, is, is, is creating teams. And that's hard in itself. <laughs> And then what we try and do is we try and um, inspire them to be part of us because we have a materials library, which is basically a catalog of, of lots of the materials we've already discovered to kind of give them inspiration, but also a place where they can make new prototypes. So prototype buildings, right? As you're developing the material, you also build a building out of it, or your car, or a phone. So you're always trying to, to elongate the length scale. And that's been very difficult. But the other bit of this, and, it, and I, you know, you said some very kind words about me before, but it's, 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 not, it's not just about keeping the subject alive. This stuff, exhibition talks, TV, radio, I would, I would encourage anyone in the audience who's thinking of going into material science, your communication skills and your ability to, to deliver these teams relies on you in, infusing people and bringing them in to our community, <laughs> these arrows that go this way. <laughs> and, um, and they have many other things to do. They might go and work for Google, for instance, or they might go and work for Facebook, or they might go and work for... Uh, you know, anyone else. And we want them to work for materials developers <laughs> to create 
you know, these, these therapies. And so we have to talk loud. We have, to, we have to say that materials, and it has always been the foundation, literally the foundation of society. The ages of civilization are named after society, right? You know, you've got, you've got Stone Age, you've got the Bronze Age, you've got the Iron Age, right? So we are the foundation, the materials community, of society. And you, if we, do, we don't say that loud and clear, we will not get this arrow <laughs> this way. Um, so that, that's been the intentional right from the beginning. And just to say that here's a, just a snapshot of some of the projects that we're doing on this front. So we're trying to create materials that know you're touching them, <laughs> have a sense of touch, but, but objects that are as big as a building that would know it was being, you know, that you've, that you've entered the building. Um, and how are we doing it? Well, we've got, we've got anthropologists involved, we've got designers and makers, we've got engineers, material scientists together, and we're basically trying to develop different techniques all the way up so that we share knowledge over the multi-scale. And I, I know I've banged on about this a lot, but I feel this is the big skill. Building teams of people and linking the scales is the thing that will be the hallmark of innovative societies like Sheffield or anyone else who wants to really lead in this field. Um, and here's another one, which is, which is about, about playing tennis. So it's, it really is me trying to look after myself, which is that we, we want to create a wearable exoskeleton that you wear as underwear. So when we talk to the patients about what they wanted, if you wanted, if you were sort of 70 or 80 and you were infirm on your feet and you wanted to play tennis again, how it would work, and they said they didn't want a piece of machinery that made them look like a robot. That they wanted to be human and appear to be normal, whatever normal means, which doesn't really mean anything, but anyway. Um, so that meant, uh, right from the word go, from our design-led methodology, we had to have this thing as underwear. So now you're saying to us, we need to create underwear in which this underwear will help my left leg, which is a bit dodgy, let's say, and my knee that's really dysfunctional, it will help them move. And my right leg, which needs less help, will need less help. So that means that this material here in my leg, this underwear, has to have what's called actuators in it, which has to have things that will lock up and help my knee stiffen when I'm, when I've got, I'm running in that one. And when, when I've, my weight's on this foot, it needs to free up and let it move freely. So what we've been designing is a set of actuators called vanadium pentoxide which basically works like a battery. Lithium, lithium atoms intercalate, they expand the fibers, and you get, you get an appreciable strain. And we put them in a gel, and we encase those in, in little lattice work, little, a little, which is like a, like a fabric. And it can lock up, or it can relax, at the touch of an electric signal. And then we have sensors built into this, which know which bits of it have locked up and which bits haven't. And then we build that into an actual fabric, which suits you, so it's exactly and we 3D print the whole thing. <laughs> so we 3D print the whole thing to fit you. And at the moment, we're at the point of it's a small material. It hardly does anything because it's so difficult to do this. Um, but I'm absolutely convinced that if you or I end up playing tennis when we're 100, <laughs> we will be wearing something like this. And it will be made with a team of people who roughly have these skills. So that's all I wanted to say. Uh, would have Phil have approved. He would have disapproved of me spelling his name wrong. I uh, know um, oh it's right. Sorry. Yeah. Um, he. Uh, sorry. He. Um, I think he would have approved. Um, you know, here is here's, here's you or me playing tennis when we're 100. <laughs> like we're looking fairly normal. Although it turns out in those times in 2050, red hair is just normal. And um, we. Yeah. I think the future is kind of it's going to be interesting, but it will definitely be led by new materials, and it will be the people in this audience, I hope, who develop them. Um, so just to sort of close and say, uh, if you want, if you want to sort of read up more about my take on this, then I've written this all down in a, an article that's just come out in the MRS bulletin. So much more of the detail of what, everything I've said. Um, if you want to find out about Institute Making, well, we've got a website, institutemaking.org.uk, and you can see on that the kind of projects we're getting up to and the problems we have. <laughs> uh, I've written a book also, which, which is kind of lays out a lot of the history of the subject, um, which, which if you are interested in glass or uh, plastics, or, then, then that's a good place to go. And finally, I, I, I feel this is really 
not the thing to say to a Sheffield audience, but <laughs> I, I really think the, the steel is one of the best materials we've ever created, if not the best. And, um, and I, it sort of slightly appalls me that less and less people know less and less about steel. <laughs> so I created this MOOC, which is an, on, it's an online course, it's free. If you know nothing about steel, or you know people who know nothing about steel, and they want a little bit of a flavor, it's a small course, you can take it online, it will take you a few days on and off to do, then uh, it exists on EDX platform. And I'm happy to say we've had all, more than 13,000 people take this course already worldwide from 133 countries. <laughs> and uh, so that, that's uh, a good thing. That shows that people are interested in materials. OK, well, thank you for listening. And um, I hope you enjoyed the talk. Thank you so much, Mark. We've heard an absolutely fantastic talk this evening. I think uh, Mark has taken on a huge challenge to talk about the future, uh, but also he's talked about the, the state of the art as we know it now and covered such a huge range of different topics. It's absolutely amazing, uh, two of which are very close to my heart. I think the, the issue of sustainability that Mark talked about is, is really important. And also uh, the length scale issue, which uh, of course covers this 100 million uh, levels of uh, length scale that we have to solve. Mark mentions up here his, his book, Stuff Matters, which I would strongly recommend that you, you go and look at. And I thought uh, it would be apt to quote what Bill Gates said about uh, Mark's book. He said, I'm pleased to report that he is witty, smart writer who has a great talent for imparting his love of this subject. And I think that exactly uh, summarizes what we've heard this evening. So to say thank you for your lecture, Mark, we have one of these uh, beautifully handcrafted bowls uh, that is made in Sheffield, a pewter bowl. So. That's very kind of you. I'm really... So very briefly, I just have to make a couple of uh, boring announcements, which is most inappropriate after a lecture like that. But I would just like to uh, <laughs> I would just like to acknowledge our sponsors, uh, for which without which we couldn't uh, do this lecture, which are Beta Technology, uh, the uh, Worshipful Company of Ironmongers, the IMECI IET Institute of Materials, SMEA of course locally, uh, TWI, and uh, Sheffield Forge Masters. So the lecture next year, you will hear in due course who the lecturer is, but this will be on the first Tuesday in December, so that is the 6th of December. That's enough of the boring stuff. The buffet is open, and I'm sure you can talk to Mark at the bar as you suggested. Thank you.